I can actually say with my hand on my heart and 100% honesty that it is a huge pleasure and privilege for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Barbara Baroness Young of Old School. Old School. Over to you, Barbara. Tonight, um, I wanted to talk about the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity, and they are genuinely twin crises, but I should give some caveats when talking, and, and that is that, um, first of all, these are my own views, um, and you can't blame the Woodland Trust. Um, secondly, I suppose my life has been in public policy and lately in gently into politics, um, but uh, so I'm not a scientist, so don't expect me to be great on the numbers. And thirdly, uh, for some ridiculous reason, way, way back, I got jobs in England and have lived there for quite a while. So if I'm a bit th uh, rusty on Scotland, forgive me that as well. But I hope some of these insights will be helpful uh, to you here in Scotland. My actual title, um, I'm now having difficulty getting this to forward here, is, is um, he doth bestride the narrow world like Colossus. Now this was spoken uh, by Cassius in, in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Uh, and of course, you're all good Scots, so you've all had a classical education. We'll know that that's a, a reference to the Colossus at Rhodes, in, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, I think it's a kind of appropriate, oh, sorry, um, my mice is, uh, doubly, my mouse is doubly um, sensitive right now. Um, I'll try and get rid of it. Um, I think it's an appropriate analogy as it's increasingly clear that the most pressing and existential issues facing the world are not COVID or ISIS or the growth of China or indeed IndyRef2. Uh, but the twin and interlinked uh, crises of climate change and biodiversity decline. And at this precise moment this year, we have a unique opportunity to influence world events on both these issues this autumn. Um, the back end of this year sees at least part of the global conference of the parties to the Convention on Biodiversity biological diversity taking place in Kunming in China. It's only going to partially take part because the Chinese have got cold feet, having lots of people arrive there with COVID. And so um, the uh, conference will be mainly online and only deal with part of the agenda. But it nevertheless is an important uh, element of international debate on biodiversity. And of course, it's racially known as, as COP15. COP26, the Conference of the Parties on, on the Climate Change Convention, is taking place, as, as you all know, in Glasgow, under the leadership of the UK, and hopefully with a strong role for Scotland. So this time is pretty key, um, and it's key for a number of reasons, uh, apart from these conferences, that we're beginning to see the front end of the six, sixth mass extinction People are beginning to herald what's happening in biodiversity as that. And in climate change, the recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned uh, of a red card for the globe uh, with strong and sustained re uh, reductions in CO2 emissions uh, needed if damaging thresholds of 1.5 degrees centigrade and 2 degrees centigrade of global warming were not to be reached. So the question really is, will the UK and Scotland bestride the world like Colossus and take a world leadership role and negotiate successful outcomes to COP15 and COP26? Will our governments persuade global leaders that we're drinking in the last chance saloon and make a real impact on the twin challenges of climate change and biodiversity, both globally and of course here at home? Or was Private Fraser right? We're doomed, you know, all doomed. Private Fraser has eyebrows like my dad, so I feel very warm towards him, but he was a bit of a, a party pooper. 
Uh, and the question really is, um, will Private Fraser be proven right? Will one or both of the conferences be damp squibs and fail to deliver uh, on credible agreements? So tonight I want briefly to lay out the scale and nature of the twin and intellect challenges. Um, I'm conscious that the two previous contributors to this webinar series went into detail about each, um, but I think I would like to give a sort of brief summary of my take on the two crises and then turn to what successful might look at for COP15 and COP26 and finish with some of the important UK and Scotland actions that we need to see happen and what government needs to do here at home to deal with their share of the global challenges and to set an ambitious example to other countries. Because it, there's no way that the UK and Scotland governments will be able to exercise global leadership if they're dragging their feet back home. So first, uh, to summarize the seriousness of the twin crisis, now recent estimates suggest that extinction threatens up to 2 million species of plants and animals, mostly as a result of human activity. And extinctions are occurring hundreds of times faster than they would do naturally. A recent report uh, by the Natural History Museum and the RSPB was published in Nature and reveals that the UK uh, status in terms of a thing they call biodiversity intactness is well below the global average and is the 29th lowest out of 20, 218 countries that were assessed. Now, it, it's possible that that sort of level of biodiversity impoverishment may well exceed the threshold below which ecosystems fail to meet society's needs. So we may well be drinking in the last chance saloon in terms of biodiversity impoverishment in this country. The State of Nature report in, in Scotland, the Scottish version of it, produced by a consortium of UK NGOs, found that, that between 1994 and 2016, 49% of Scottish species decreased in abundance and only 28 increased in abundance. Now those that decrease tend to be those with special requirements with niche habitats and uh, other requirements. And those that increase tend to be those with general needs. Uh, so a kind of verminous kind of species, if one can look at it that way. Um, but basically the complex ecosystems on which species, including you and me depend, are a bit like a house of cards, a house of cards made up of species. And it's so high, you can't see the top of it and you can't see the bottom of it. And it's so wide, you can't see the edges of it. And yet we as mankind are gaily plucking species randomly from this delicate edifice, uh, card by card, species by species, without understanding what this does to the strength of the overall edifice. And at some stage, we run the risk of collapse of vital ecosystems. On climate change, the recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change comprehensively indicated that warming will increase faster than previously estimated. I, I quote them in saying climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying. And the report finds that unless there are immediate rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees centigrade or even two degrees centigrade will be beyond reach. So that's pretty grim. At the current rate of emissions, uh, it's estimated that we will exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming within five to 12 years. So this is very, very much sooner than had been anticipated. And the impacts of climate change are already affecting millions of people around the world. In 2020 alone, Australian bushfires scorched 11 million hectares of land and caused hundreds of deaths. In California, 9,200 fires burned millions of hectares and turned the Golden State black. 
And across Africa, hundreds of thousands were displaced by devastating floods. While record setting locust storms destroyed crops and threatened food security. Temperatures hit 38 degrees centigrade in the Arctic and summer ice levels were the second lowest on record. In 2021, as if 2020 wasn't bad enough, North American experienced a one in 10,000 year heat wave and temperatures soared to 47 degrees centigrade in Vancouver. Climate change is having substantial implications in the UK for heat waves, for storminess, for flood events on the water cycle, on agriculture, on forestry, on sea level rise, on soils and biodiversity. And the UK and Scottish governments have quite rightly declared climate emergencies. So this is all a bit more in the private Fraser territory than striding the globe like Colossus. We're doomed, we're all doomed. Now the interrelationship of biodiversity and climate change is close and it's not sufficiently recognized. Nature-based solutions are vital in tackling climate change. And indeed, it's been estimated that they could meet a third of the Paris Agreement targets in very short order. There's no way we can stay below one and a half degrees centigrade without nature and vice versa. If we don't stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade, nature will decline even more rapidly. So the two crises need to be challenged, tackled together. So what can we hope for from these two important conferences of the parties, COP15 on biodiversity and COP26 on climate change? Well, let's turn to COP15. Now, previous uh, biodiversity convention conferences have not exactly been covered in glory. Over the last 10 years, the biodiversity targets set at the conference at HE in 2010 failed dismally to be delivered. Uh, this had a, a, a range of underlying causes. The, the COP, while agreeing targets, which was good, failed to develop a mechanism to determine what each country would deliver, which was bad. There were no enforcement mechanisms agreed and the richer countries failed to provide finance for lower income countries to help with implementation of the agreement. So what can we hope and is it possible to hope for more from COP15? Now the Chinese are president of COP15 this time round and they're pretty organized and have openly said they are committed and I use the words carefully to ambitious, practical and balanced targets. And I think we've just got to watch the weaselly nature of the practical and balanced uh, words because uh, it may well be that that waters down the ambitious part of their commitment. On the other hand, you can't deny the need for stuff to be practical and balanced, but if we're drinking in the last chance saloon for biodiversity as well as climate change, we probably have to push the boat out a bit further. They're also committed uh, to a, a clear and simple means of uh, evaluating progress and to strong mechanisms for implementation. So that, that's um, encouraging from the presidency. But some of the more detailed stuff um, is not in their lexicon at all. The Chinese president is totally silent on the 30 by 30 ambition held by the UK in many developed and emerging countries worldwide. That's the aim of bringing 30% of land and sea into protected status by 2030. And the lower income nations where most of the global biodiversity is still comparatively intact, are unwilling to play ball at all unless a deal is reached on ensuring that they gain benefits from the digital sequencing of the genetics of their biodiversity so that this valuable data is not simply stolen from them by rich global com companies. And no deal on this appears to be on the Chinese agenda at all. 
COP15 will also not succeed unless it's owned by the parties rather than by the convention secretariat or the presidency. Previous convention outcomes have been very much creatures of the presidency and the secretariat and the par parties themselves have been a bit semi-detached, which accounts for lack of delivery uh, since 2010. Alas, um, the UK is not in a good place to influence the Chinese leadership, as every time the UK mentions Hong Kong or human rights issues, China resents the UK interfering in what it regards as China's internal affairs and basically does the Chinese equivalent of going off on one. Uh, I'm telling tales out of school uh, that the briefing for my select committee when we were interviewing the Chinese ambassador was faintly hilarious in that the list of things we weren't supposed to raise was longer than the list of the things we were supposed to raise. It was very much, don't talk about the war. So the UK government needs to be very proactive if we're gonna get an outcome from COP15. Um, they need to ensure that they reach out to international partners to promote agreements on a whole range of things. First of all, on a clear, ambitious and measurable set of targets, along with strong uh, uh, mechanisms for implementation, including for monetary, monitoring countries' progress. Now, all of that, the Chinese will accord with to some extent. Uh, they need to ensure that their international commitments to more biodiversity funding and they need to get out of the hole that it's in the compromise on di digital sequence information. And they need to very much harness partnerships with global businesses um, and make sure that global businesses across many sectors, especially those involved in agriculture and international trade, um, are required to report on their biodiversity in impacts and to make sure that biodiversity is integrated into multilateral and bilateral trade agreements. So the UK government can play a role from the sidelines. It can act as a cheerleader, uh, but alas, it's not going to have the welly with the Chinese that it will need to really uh, help shape the way that the presidency is going to take this forward. And of course, at the end of the day, both the UK and the Sc Scottish government will need to demonstrate credibility and commitment by implementing policies like these at a national and local level. Uh, there's been a recent report by Dasgupta who reviewed the economics of biodiversity, uh, which put forward a number of res recommendations, rather two recommendations, too many recommendations, I suspect, but they're pretty clear. Uh, the main thesis is that nature has got to be embedded in economic and financial decision making right across government departments. Um, the, there are some government departments where I'm totally convinced that they think biodiversity is a washing powder um, and they wouldn't know it if it was swimming across their soup. Well, we can't continue to live with that. A clear test of government resolve in terms of implementing the key premise of Dasgupta uh, will be the re-engineering of agricultural subsidies now that we've brexited and the common agricultural policy measures are beginning to expire. Agricultural subsidies need to be re-engineered to ensure they deliver for biodiversity and for climate change and for a whole range of other public goods, not just for food production and the farming industry. So that is going to be the first and one of the most important tests of embedding economic and financial nature into economic and financial decision making across all government departments. So achieving all this for COP15, especially when we aren't in the driving seat, is quite a tall order. And so is ensuring it all happens post-conference and is integrated with the COP26 climate change actions. Actions. So I guess I'm more in the private Fraser camp for COP15, more doom than Colossus. But we are in the driving seat as president of COP26 in Glasgow. 
Uh, and climate change is a much more trendy issue in international and UK terms. Governments, businesses, local authorities and the public, especially young people, are increasingly convinced that urgent action on climate change is important. My previous international agreements have had some success uh, uh, and, and a better record than the biodiversity uh, conference outcomes. The, the previous COP, uh, which forged the Paris Agreement, was a, a comparative success with um, some pretty stunning high level political mobilization, a, a very clear and motivating single number ambition in the warming targets, very easy thing to latch onto 1.5 degrees centigrade, 2 degrees centigrade, unambiguous and simple. The agreement, including a, a ratcheting mechanism to ratchet up ambition as part of the implementation and negotiate an agreement on how to unlock resources for implementation and mobilize the whole series of non-government actors, especially businesses. So it was a pretty good success. And there has been some success in the early part of this year in the work up to COP26. The G7 meeting, which the, the UK chaired, said all the right things. Uh, there's been developed a high ambition coalition of, of key states uh, and, and they are in place and ready to act. Um, the two biggest emitters, China and the USA, have committed to action. The business sector is incredibly active with Mark Carney, who is the former governor of the Bank of England, leading this effort on a global basis. Uh, however, um, there are some downsides and it's going to be increasingly necessary that civil society that's showing increased commitment, particularly amongst young people, to the whole need to combat climate change, keeps that momentum going to keep our politicians honest. The reasons to be less cheerful about COP26 um, are that the signatories so the Paris Agreement committed to limiting warming well below two degrees C and to pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees C. But since 2015, when that was agreed, emissions have continued to increase and ambition levels are too low to keep the target within reach. The national commitments that do exist are not backed up by totally credible plans and resources haven't been released to the low income countries for implementation. The, the UK presidency is gonna have an uphill struggle, but it absolutely needs to get COP26 to deliver ambitious targets backed by delivery plans. Two thirds of the global economy is now covered by net zero targets, but the early trajectories for the next 10 years are not yet ambitious enough and are not supported by credible and realistic delivery plans. The presidency needs to ensure that nature-based solutions are incorporated uh, into uh, the agreement and um, a pathway needs to be developed for low and middle income countries that supports financially their route towards not just decarbonisation and climate resilience, but in the spirit of fairness and equity, access to energy that doesn't damage the climate or biodiversity, and the potential for economic growth that does not lock the poorer and middle income countries into uh, an undeveloped position. The government also needs to make sure that there are strong partnerships with the business activity that's already showing promise. Uh, uh, that the climate change is positioned in mainstream politics across the globe. And that the public consciousness and civil society act action that's growing is continually fostered and built on. So how confident am I uh, that the government 
Well, actually, just before I go on, on civil society action and public consciousness, I suspect uh, in Glasgow, you'll see quite a lot of uh, things that represent attempts to wind up public consciousness in the run up to COP26. Uh, now you could call them stunts and many people will, but there's no doubt about it. We do need a bit of a razzmatazz for the public around COP26. So that while the dry stuff that I've been talking about is going on in the formal conference sessions, uh, the engagement of people of all sorts from right across the world is enabled through the NGO program that's planned and through some of the stunts that I know the UK and Scotland government are planning to pull off. So will we succeed? Uh, will the UK pull off this leadership role? Apart from intense diplomacy uh, and alliance building in the run up to the conference success, will to some extent depend on the UK showing commitment to action at home. Uh, we have world, world leading climate change legislation in Scotland and England and Wales. But now let's look at some key issues for domestic delivery for both climate change and biodiversity that are of particular importance in Scotland. And these are the issues I'm going to cover. They're far from comprehensive. I mean, I've said nothing about transport or energy, but I particularly want to focus on those uh, that are uh, the things that um, I spend my time on and the things that are uniquely uh, important in Scottish terms. So first of all, who delivers? Well, the answer to that is pretty well everybody. It isn't just about governments. It's comforting that increasingly responsible business is taking a lead role globally and locally. Um, now, we shouldn't be under any illusions. They're partly responding to public opinion about climate change and biodiversity. They're partly seeing new business opportunities um, that the, the, the twin challenges open up uh, and the search for innovation that, that will prompt. And they're partly seeing the writing on the wall for the old ways of doing things. Local governments are vital across the four nations of the UK. They're key players in delivering zero carbon and biodiversity recovery and are far more in touch with people and communities than any national government ever can be. Uh, many local authorities have themselves declared climate emergencies and have developed practical nature recovery strategies. National governments can't do it without these two key groups, government, uh, local government and, and business. It is, however, possible to imagine a situation where business and local government galvanization could go a long way to delivering in spite of national governments. We saw that in the States with Donald Trump, when individual states decided that irrespective of the president, they were gonna get their state to deliver uh, on climate change. Now, in an ideal situation, national governments provide the legislative and economic frameworks that enables that local action. For example, we are having endless hours of happy fun in the House of Lords, uh, putting through the Environment Bill for England. Uh, in the Westminster Parliament, and it will set the framework for local authorities to deliver nature recovery strategies through uh, nature recovery networks, which will be on a local spatial level. Uh, and also it sets the framework for local authority planning to require 10% net biodiversity gain from all developments. Um, climate change legislation in each of the four nations um, set rolling carbon budgets and the framework for actions at both a national and a local level on climate change mitigation. Uh, and so it's great if we can get genuine partnership between government, local government and business, but civil society will play an increasing role as public concern mounts 
and young people take it as read that biodiversity and climate change are important and want to act to save the world they're inheriting. Let me move on to land use. This is my um, this is my favourite pastime of the moment. Land use in the UK, well, land in the UK is is precious and finite, and we aren't making any more. Um, but it's under huge pressure. Um, demands for land are multiple, and they're increasing. We need land for agriculture and healthy food production, for forestry and timber production, for access, for recreation, and the health. That they produce for nature recovery, uh, we're going to need land. That land can help with flood risk management and water protection. Um, and a growing population, we're going to have 10 million more people in the UK, uh, allegedly, uh, needs more land for housing and built development. The need for carbon sequestration in land is growing rapidly. Uh, and big questions are being asked about whether we need to become more self-sufficient in food and in timber. The majority of UK timber is currently imported. Now, the um, University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership conducted a demand supply analysis uh, on land, and they found that to meet a growing UK population's food, space and energy needs, while increasing the area needed to protect and enhance the nation's natural capital, the UK would need to find as a whole another 7 million hectares of land. Now, we only have 24.25 million hectares at the moment, so that means finding almost a third again of the land that we currently have. And you may not have noticed, but we aren't making any more land right now. Um, so that's a big, big challenge and means two things. One, land needs to be multifunctional and deliver multiple benefits at the same time. And many of our current processes for making decisions about land, the spatial planning system, the forestry and agricultural policy frameworks, individual decisions by landowners, farmers and foresters, they all need to be more effectively integrated rather than operated in silos at the moment. Land use decisions are often made that are wildly contradictory. Now, you can be really proud in Scotland because you have a land use framework. And in fact, you're on the version number three, I think. Um, and the same is the case for Wales and Northern Ireland. They, they are very different in each of the countries, but they all set principles for optimizing the use of land. England doesn't even have a framework. It's being dragged, kicking and screaming towards developing one. Um, I am doing most of the kicking. Um, some might say about the Scottish land use framework that um, they haven't really yet been implemented, though I'm sure the Land Commission would assert differently. <coughs> but at least there is a debate well underway on the principles and values that should inform decisions on completing land use and how to optimise multiple benefits from the same patch of land and how to encourage the best land use in the most appropriate place. Scotland is by far the key player in the UK for contributing land for carbon sequestration for nature-based solutions. Scotland has extensive peatlands, existing forests and space for further for afforestation for carbon and biodiversity. We all welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to a major peatland restoration programme of 250 million over 10 years. And I look forward to the prohibition of ploughing on peat. But arguments are, however, breaking out over the science of carbon and land. Scotland is 25% peat. Peat is more effective at sequestering carbon than a newly planted woodland, which will in its early stages emit rather than sequester carbon. But planted woodlands, can have other benefits. So we do need to be more self-sufficient in timber, both softwood and hardwood, and native woodlands are best for biodiversity. So we need the right tree in the right place and also to understand the carbon balance of natural regeneration of woodland. Which takes me to woods. Um, you couldn't really expect me as chairman of the Woodland Trust to do this presentation without getting a plug in for woods. Uh, the Woodland 
Trust last year published a state of UK woods and trees, uh, which was a stock trick on native woods and trees, their status, the threats to them and the benefits, and was intended to inform action on nature recovery and tackling the climate emergency. And the key findings um, include the fact that although woodland cover is increasing gradually, woodland wildlife is decreasing. Woodland birds have declined by 29% since 1970, butterflies by 41% since 1990, and plants by a staggering 18% since 2015. The UK woodland cover has more than doubled in the last 100 years, but from very low baselines, and much of the increase is in non-native species. Existing native woodlands are isolated and in poor ecological condition with only 7% of all native woodlands in good overall condition. And there's widespread loss of what we call trees outside woods, trees in hedgerows, trees uh, in built development, trees standing alone in the landscape, trees in wood pasture, um, all of which um, add to tree biodiversity and include important ancient trees, which are incredibly rich in biodiversity. Now, trees and woods are subject to, um, excuse me, a huge range of threats. Um, and Scotland's got its fair share. There are now more diseases uh, waiting to invade the trees of Britain than there are trees. Um, and also we suffer from invasive plants like rhododendron. Ash dieback in England is disastrous. Many of the trees outside woods in hedgerows are ash. It's going to change the landscape of England dramatically. If it wasn't bad enough to have diseases in plants, we've also got deer and squirrels with varying performance on deer management and uh, the search for a contraception for squirrels continuing. Climate impacts have a, an impact on woods and trees themselves, as does air pollution. And of course, development. Um, my favourite um, carbon reducing transport mechanism, HS2, uh, drives a coach and horses through a very large number of ancient woodlands. So it's not a great success. So when we heard um, in the run-up to the English election, each of the political parties trying to outdo each other on ambitious planting targets, it became faintly hysterical. Every, every manifesto that came out had a bigger number. Uh, uh, and governments have set these ambitious targets for planting, particularly in England, to meet the Committee on Climate Change carbon budgets requirements uh, if we're going to meet net zero by 2050. And of course, similar targets are being set in the four UK nations. But these planting targets generally are not being met. The greatest achievement is in Scotland, but the majority of planting is non-native conifers. And uh, though it's contested, I believe that they deliver less benefit for biodiversity and probably less carbon benefit over their life cycle. So what needs to happen? Well, here's just a small short list. First of all, we need to expand the woodland cover. We're still at a very low base. Uh, I believe there needs to be a concentration on native woodland creation. Um, otherwise, the risk is that commercial softwoods will dominate. And I think that would be a real pity because uh, the biodiversity case for native woodland is, I believe, more powerful. We need to make sure that the trees that are planted are UK and Ireland sourced and grown so that we don't run the risk of bringing in any new pests. But we also need to take opportunities to see trees that aren't in woodlands, but incorporated into new built developments, for example, to give health and air quality benefits in settlements. We need more trees outside woods. There needs to be support and subsidy for improving the condition of existing woodlands. 
and we need to foster those links between people and woods which very genuinely already exist. I was amazed when I became chairman of the Woodland Trust that I could not find somebody to walk up to and say, do you like trees? Who wouldn't immediately say, I love trees. Um, there is a real affinity between people in the UK and their woods and trees. Even if they never go to see them, they simply believe they're a good thing. And we need to make sure that those links are fostered and develop. And last but not least, we need a mix of public and private finance and the right sort of incentives to get all the aforesaid to happen. Let me turn to agriculture. 25% of all global emissions uh, come from food production and ag agriculture, particularly animal products and especially beef and lamb. 18% of Scotland's emissions are from agriculture. The UK Climate Change Committee says we need to cut meat and dairy consumption by 20% and focus on a more plant-based diet. So in all of that, there are actions for farmers and indeed for individuals as consumers. Agriculture also has a huge impact on biodiversity. Um, in the UK, much of the decline in our biodiversity over the last 70 years has been caused by habitat loss due to agricultural intensification driven by inappropriate subsidies. So if we're going to make net zero and reverse biodiversity decline, we need to define a different pattern of agriculture focused on healthy and affordable food production, the protection and recovery of biodiversity and carbon reduction. And we need to enable a fair and just transition for farmers and food producers. Um, with financial incentives still in place, but redesigned. Sorry, I've got very, House Lords computers are very sensitive, as you may have gathered. <laughs> um, so that just transition, we talked about redesigned financial incentives still being in place. We need to see them delivering public goods by payment of public money. We need to see advice in place and reskilling initiatives to help farmers take up these new roles. And there needs to be equitable retirement schemes and benefits to allow those substantial number of older farmers who simply want to give up. Um, a fair and just transition needs clarity from government as to what subsidy schemes are on offer and how agriculture and forestry and tree planting and carbon subsidies fit with each other. And that information needs to be available soon because the land management decisions that need to be made need to be made well in advance and maybe about changing the use of land for several decades. So they're very, very important. But at the moment, farmers are wading through porridge because they haven't got sufficient clarity from governments right across the UK. If you want to read some good stuff on a just and fair transition, I'm a commissioner on the Commission on Food and Farming and the Countryside, and they're working in all four nations uh, to design uh, the sorts of agricultural systems and the sorts of transition arrangements that we need. In England, uh, the environmental land management scheme has been designed to replace the European Common Agricultural Policy payments. It's been under development for several years, consists of a basic level scheme that delivered some environmental benefits, a more ambitious scheme delivering specific local biodiversity objectives and a more heroic scheme for groups of land managers to deliver at a landscape level working together. Um, it's still at the pilot stage. Pilots have been piloted and more pilots have been piloted. And I hope that the piloting comes to some conclusions soon. Um, in, because in all four countries, the existing scheme of payments begins to reduce from 2024. So we haven't got long to go. A big question, of course, is whether the, the cap subsidy will remain in place in full uh, in this new definition of agricultural support. 
or will the treasury, as treasuries are wont to do, get its shuffle in because that's what it's always wanted to do with uh, common agricultural uh, payments and I suspect that they will have the same sentiments now. But at a time when land management has to deliver on a growing set of multiple objectives, I earnestly hope that treasuries and governments can see the multiple benefits of maintaining the level of subsidy but making it work differently for its living. I'm going to finish shortly, uh, but let me just talk about trade. I'm sorry about my dribbling news. I had a very difficult brush with a lateral flow test um, and my sinuses have never recovered. Um, though in agricultural terms, we all welcome a focus on healthy and affordable food locally produced. Of course, we import and export much food uh, to my certain knowledge, we can't yet grow pineapples in the Cairngorms and the world loves Scotch whiskey. Um, and in 2019, um, the UK supplied just 55% of its, um, its own food that was consumed in the UK. We import significantly more fruit, veg and meat than we export. And so trade is a seminal issue for climate change and for biodiversity. Too often the richer nations have ostensibly cleaned up their act domestically on carbon and biodiversity by exporting the impacts to poorer nations. The UK government as part of the COP15 and 26 processes is laying a requirement on UK companies to ensure their international supply chains are forest friendly, but at the same time, we need to be wary of a chain of successive free trade deals post Brexit that could reduce environmental and indeed animal welfare standards and risk undercutting UK farmers bound by higher UK standards. The Australian trade deal was always likely to be small scale but gave little comfort on standards and a US free trade deal will be a much more serious challenge. In their preparations for the 2021 ministerial meeting of the UN Conference for Trade and Development, governments have highlighted climate and the environment crisis as one of three key themes. The WTO, not everybody's cup of tea, has initiated structured discussions on trade and environmental sustainability, so at least they're conscious of the need to do so. Companies are recognizing the array of environmental threats to supply chain resilience and the importance of improved environmental performance to their long-term business prospects and their license to operate and the business potential of global markets for green products. So the political momentum in favor of green trade is building, uh, but we need now to ensure our approach to international trade diplomacy, both multilateral and bilateral builds on that foundation. So what's the conclusion then? Will we lead the world to successful outcomes from the COPs this autumn? Is it bestriding the narrow world like Colossus or did Private Fraser get it right? Of course, it's perhaps not he doth bestride the narrow world like Colossus. Perhaps it's she doth bestride the narrow world like Colossus. But I think we should all remember that twin crises won't go away after the COPs. We've got to be in this for the long run, but not too long, for time is running out. UK and local action is going to be really important, and we've got to use the COPs to get maximum leverage on our own governments. I think the bright light of hope in all this is our young people. Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg may not be your cup of tea, but young people know what sort of natural world they want to inherit. And I have confidence in their enthusiasm and their wish for action and their willingness to undertake it themselves. So as all conservationists and environmentalists, I'm optimistic 
we will find a way, we will continue the fight, and we'll have fun in Glasgow. I'm very pleased to have been able to share these thoughts with you tonight, and I look forward to taking your questions. Barbara, it is a tragedy that uh, we can't hear applause uh, with this system because I'm sure it, it, it would be loud and that was, um, that was a fabulous tour de force. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Just to reiterate how things are going to go now, um, we're going to take a five minute break um, during which people, people can, can comfort themselves. Um, also, please consider um, putting questions into the Q&A box. We already have four questions in there. Please try and keep them brief if possible. Um, we'll then have, uh, have um, the question session where Barbara, Barbara will give her views on, on the points that are made. And um, after that, we will have a, a, a short closing session um, just to, to wind up these three lectures um, on environment, uh, climate and biodiversity. Which, is, which has been the theme of which Barbara's is the last one, from the chair of the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow, Professor Pat Monan. So, but for now, uh, George, if you'd like to put up a, uh, a clock on the screen so we can see five minute, five minute break, during which please do consider um, uh, adding questions to the Q&A box. Barbara, thanks again, and, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Hello again, everybody. I, I hope you can hear us okay. Um, thank you very much for um, stay, staying with us. Um, I'm now going to um, have a look at the Q&A box. And uh, I see there are 15 questions there. That's a, that's a lot of questions. Um, I hope questioners will forgive me for perhaps um, paraphrasing um, some, some of the longer ones, um, uh, just so that we get through as many as possible. In fact, there seem to be 17 questions now. So um, I, I'll make a start if that's all right, Barbara. And the first question we have is from Sheila O'Reilly. And uh, this question is really um, about the prospect of the UK actually providing support in terms of funds for, for, for biodiversity conservation and almost for also for um, climate change uh, ad adaptation uh, uh, mitigation. Um, in the light of the recent uh, and highly controversial cuts that were made uh, in terms of uh, overseas development assistance funding from the UK, what really are the prospects that will play a, a constructive role with regards to those lower income countries that you, you, you covered quite extensively in your talk? Um. The ODA cuts for me were a bit of a wild card. I mean, I just think that there was absolutely no thought went into the wider ramifications. <clears throat> They've had a disastrous effect on a whole load of things, including British global co collaborative research and a whole ver variety of fields. It's been appalling. And I think, to be honest, it was just one of these decisions that governments didn't think about. It looked like an easy target. It looked like something that the public would like you know not giving money away to all these foreigners um the reverse side of that is that britain has got quite a good track record if it does forge international agreements on funding arrangements they actually forks out whereas there are a whole load of countries who enter into these international funding agreements and don't pay their share um so i'm moderately hopeful that if if there can be an international agreement reached that we will do our bit the big problem will be getting us uh, sufficiently ambitious and uh, comprehensive agreement over the finishing line in the first place. Okay, thanks. That, thanks, Barbara. And I hope that, that that paraphrasing was fair in your view, Sheila. If not, you can shoot me shoot me later. Uh, the next question is from Andy Hlanwarn. And um, he asks, um, given your concerns about the pressures for land use, should increasing areas of productive land be given over to solar farms? I must admit, I'm a bit of an iconoclast about solar farms because I do look at them and think um, what better I could be doing with that land. Um, and I, did, I think we need to look at different technologies for solar power. Uh, we've got acres of um, 
building space, um, roofs, walls, and there are new technologies that can allow uh, for solar power to be generated on buildings in a much more effective way. And it does seem to me that that uh, using land extensively for solar uh, power is a, is a is a is a contradiction. You're absolutely right that that when we're going to be short of land, we should be thinking of how we can use land in ways that produces multiple benefits and doesn't wipe out everything else. Because really, all of the evidence about being able to combine solar farms with biodiversity is a load of old tosh. Okay. Press, press com. <laughs> <laughs> I always like Perscom, although the, the Professor Monham probably doesn't. Um, okay, the next question comes from Jill Matthews, and it's more of an observation, if that's fair, Jill. What she's 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 focusing on the Sergeant Fraser paradigm, we're doomed, uh, and, and and how do we how do we actually make progress? And she's just making the observation: it's extremely hard to stop people doing stuff that they like doing including using fossil fuels, consuming meat, um, being over consumption in, 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 in general. And Jill's view is that the law is often the best way to stop people from doing things that, that they don't like. But are we ever gonna persuade people to vote for governments that will introduce unpopular legislation? I think that's why, um, why term a basket of instruments is usually the right way forward. I mean, legislation is more effective. I mean, when I was a regulator at the Environment Agency, I used to constantly tell people that, um, um, that we needed to be content that on occasions, legislation and regulation was actually a good thing because it drove change in the most straight line and also gave clarity to businesses and individuals who had to adjust to it rather than uh, leaving them in any, any doubt. But there's no doubt about it. You need to, that also to be accompanied with uh, changing public opinion, with education, with financial incentives, as well as legislative sticks. Um, and by trying to construct win-win situations that produce benefit for people, as well as uh, downside and and I think you know there are some examples of that that currently I mean the the whole debate about food is changing very rapidly at the moment the young people leading that quite a lot of the time um it, it's entertaining if those of you who go to dinner parties will realize that people don't talk about their houses for very long now they talk about their electric cars um and of course it's not universal yet but the combination of um fiscal incentives on fuel uh, making it easier for people to have electric cars because the charging system is available and cheap uh, and being able to demonstrate economic benefits in terms of running costs all of those things will will need to come into play and it's it's going to have to become the the acceptable thing that that will, providing we can produce enough green energy to be able to charge the damn things great th th thank you barbara and thanks for sticking with it because yeah um, you you're very popular and, and lots of people want to ask you questions. So um, the next one is um, tricky, tricky. Okay. So uh, this <laughs> is from Neil. Up. Neil. And Neil asks, is indefinite economic growth compatible with protecting biodiversity? I think we've got to redefine growth uh, in some respects, uh, but I think it is to be frank, you know, if you look at some of the developing countries of the world who've let frogged, the industrial Revo revolution and are going straight for greener technologies is really very very encouraging so I, I i suspect that it's dead easy in a country like ours to say everybody's just got to be content with what they've got but if you're living in great swathes of the world that really don't have access to some of the basic stuff we have like um, supplies of energy um, like reasonable living standards I think that we've got to assume that we've got to find these new ways of growth that allow the developing world to develop. Um, it would be bizarre if we were to say, well, we're all right, we're pulling the drawbridge up now. Uh, that, and it would be unsustainable. That is fascinating. One of the most optimistic answers I've, uh, I've heard to that question. Very interesting. Um, the next question is from um, John Claxton. 
who asks, uh, he says, yes, this interested me, this bit of your talk as well. He said, you mentioned that there would be a concern at COP15 about uh, the biodiversity one. That's about poorer countries' genetic biological resources being exploited by companies from richer parts of the world. Isn't that already being addressed by the Nagoya Protocol or is that considered in need of strengthening? Do you think that needs uh, is in need of strengthening? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that um, the evidence that we took um, from people from um, lower income countries when we were looking at COP15 in the House of Lords um, was universal, that they were all concerned about this. So I'm assuming that they think Nagoya is, doesn't, doesn't hack it. Um, now, whether Nagoya strengthening is the answer or what, but there's clearly a very strong push. I mean, to some extent, the, 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 the emerging countries have seen a way of putting leverage on the West, basically, on the developing country, on the developed countries. They've, they've recognised that they've got the biggest share of, of uh, biodiversity and genetic diversity and that they're going to not agree to do anything unless they get benefits from the sequencing. And so, you know, it's a self-interest thing um, and good on them, I say. Yeah. Um, but I don't honestly know whether Nagoya would be the vehicle or whether we need something specific that comes out of COP, COP15, but it won't. Alas, it won't. And that could well be the straw that breaks the camel's back. That could well be the stumbling block for, uh, for COP15 because, um, you know, if the... I, I, I was blooded in my first international negotiation about 30 years ago by failing to recognize the power of indigenous peoples um, and a close brush with the Inuit has convinced me that um, people from developing countries when they found a way of getting leverage can use it very effectively so that could well be something that gets in the way. Really interesting I think those of us who kind of work in this field this, this could come at us from sitting in this country from left field this, this, this kind of stuff so um, I'll be keeping an eye out on that. Thanks for the question. Really good. Next Don't question. Don't let is, anybody genetically sequence your Highland coup. I just <laughs> hands off them. Um, the next question is from an anonymous attendee, but um, you're going to like it. Actually, the next two questions, because they, they really are about trees. And anonymous attendee, I happen to know that uh, Barbara really is interested in rare trees because she has them in her garden, rare native trees. So the question is, today's report um, highlights that even in the UK there are native trees in danger of extinction. Should we put more emphasis on cultivating, planting these rare trees? And uh, the anonymous attendee here, she says, Aaron Whitebeam, for example, one of my favourites, Plymouth pear, black poplar, um, rather than always planting the same old standards, oak, beech, lime, birch, etc. What do you think, Barbara? I, I'm, I'm all for that. Um... Some of them are, you know, have got a definite death wish. You know, the Plymouth pear is bloody difficult to, to grow. Um, and, um, you know, so good on you if you can get, if you can get them to, to grow. Um, I think some of them are just unpopular and we've really got to make sure that there is a sufficient program. I mean, it's like rare breeds of any kind. There needs to be a proper program that addresses the root causes for the decline in the first place. Um, but let me just have a, put a bit of propaganda in while I'm at it. I am um, seriously pissed off, technical term, um, with the um, current proposition from the various national manifestations of the Forestry Commission um, for plant planting as part of the commercial mix species from several degrees south in order to combat climate change because I think the science is increasingly pointing to the fact that a native tree planted in native soils with an assemblage of native other species and micro species has more chance of adapting to climate change than something that can grow okay in a slightly greater degree of heat, but has none of the advantages of being part of a wider ecosystem that it recognises and loves. And end of rant. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Um, I, I hope we're going to get through these questions. Somebody better tell me when I have to stop. But the next one, 
is also about trees from Kay Seal. Uh, it's more of a point. Kay says that the penalties for the removal of trees by developers is so small as to be no deterrent at all. While the cost for local groups and others to put a preservation order on a tree is considerable. Discuss. I agree. Um, we probably ought to campaign to get the penalties up. I hope that um, the sort of thing that's being proposed for England might well prove popular elsewhere. This, this concept that developments are going to have to benefit, are going to have to demonstrably show a 10% net biodiversity gain. And if you're chopping trees down, you're reducing your chance of delivering the 10% gain because you're going to have to make that gain even bigger. Um, now, it's going to be a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare keeping track of all that. Um, and that's my big worry about net biodiversity gain that we're arguing about in the climate in the environment bill in parliament in Westminster at the moment. Um, but I also think that it's going to have to become a thing for local vigilantism. Uh, you know, it's, it's local people who can spot these things because they happen in a trice. You know, the bulldozer happens to run over the tree. Um, and I do think that um, along with increased penalties for wanton destruction of trees, um, we, um, we need local folks to start saying, I love trees, I don't want them chopped down. We had that in bucket loads in Sheffield where the local authority <laughs> decided that the pavements were a bit messy with all these tree roots around and we better just chop them all down. Um, and 81 year old ladies of great moral virtue were chaining themselves to lime trees. It was great. Oh, you'd be proud of me, Barbara, because I was out across the road over there, actually, at three in the morning once I'm trying to stop some unnecessary tree felling that was going on. Anyway, next question. William Maxwell. William asks, um, says that in his youth, uh, food supply was seasonal and, and probably relatively locally produced. Should we return to living a seasonally based lifestyle with regard to food growth and consumption to rationalise agricultural produ production and reduce imports? I think the answer might be, might be yes to this. I think the answer is yes, and I think there are things that are happening that will help with that. I mean, local farmers markets, um, it's very trendy for people to live seasonally now and to only produce food that is reasonably locally grown. More people as a result of COVID are growing their own. Um, the supermarkets are slowly getting the message, though we still see too much microprocessed foods and fizzy drinks being in the basket of poorer income households. Um, but um, I hope that the work that's going on in education in schools, in trying to reform school dinners, um, and uh, in helping those members of the public who do want to eat seasonally to be able to do so, will begin to have some traction. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Mary McDougall. Mary uh, says, Baroness Young, many thanks for your talk, exclamation mark. In terms of biodiversity, could you comment on the use of pesticides in agriculture and forestry, please? Does the Woodland Trust, for example, use herbicides, fungicides, insecticides in woodland management? Um, the Woodland Trust has pretty well uh, stopped using any chemicals at all on its own land. We in a very, very rare occasion of something noxious that has got a legal requirement laid on it might use um, chemical, but generally speaking, we don't. Um, the whole VEX question of pesticides in agriculture is one that um, is incredibly complicated. I mean, first of all, precision agriculture and the use of you know, satellite-aided technology and and smart machines could, and particularly robot-aided production, could well um, reduce the need for herbicides and pesticides. Um, but um, at the moment, that is not yet universally there. And one of the worries that I've got is that the genetically modified and 
genetically influenced agriculture lobby continue to see that as a way of reducing herbicide and pesticide use without adequate environmental safeguards for the development of these crops and products. Mm. So it's a complicated position at the moment. And there is no doubt about it. Uh, we wouldn't be able to feed the world right now if we simply banned all herbicides and pesticides. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Azura Meadows, and um, I'm quite close to my heart, actually. Uh, what has been done to combat the illegal trade of non-native plant species, bringing in, you know, plant material, fruit and vegetable uh, from overseas as banned in flights? How rigorous and successful is the control? I think it's true to say, I don't exactly know what's happening in Scotland, but certainly in England and in other parts of the world, like well, of the UK, um, like Northern Ireland, where the position is extremely muddled as a result of the agreement, um, things have gone backwards. I mean, Brexit has meant that instead of uh, all the checks being carried out at the point of entry, they're now carried out at hubs well away from the point of entry. So if things are coming in that are illegal, um, though they've all got to have the equivalent of a plant passport, they are going to be potentially out and about before we know it. So I'm a bit disappointed in what's happened as a, in order to smooth the Brexit process, quite frankly. Um, the Woodland Trust believes that the most sensible way to reduce the amount of plant-based pest introduction into the UK and to try and ward off some of the ones that we really are worried about, like Xylella, which in seems to me to infect everything that it touches. Um, we just need to get this movement for UK sourced and grown absolutely established and really lay a big challenge down to the horticultural trade. Um, I think there are jobs and livelihoods and businesses to be had in growing more of our plant material in the UK from scratch, um, rather than simply relying on the Netherlands to do it for us, which is basically what we do at the moment. So we need to tighten the legislation and the regulation and the inspection, but we need to have a much, much more robust policy of trying to get everything UK sourced and grown. I lay a challenge down to all public authorities, only plant UK sourced and grown trees. Um, and we can help at the Woodland Trust to enable you to do that. I, I agree with that 100%. Um, and it's a great question. So thanks, Azra. Um, <laughs> Okay, Barbara Samson um, has a, you know, a, a painful question to us, really. That, um, there have been suggestions that Extinction Rebellion are going to target Glasgow um, in the event of disruptive behaviour. Is, is it possible that that could actually switch the public off to the bigger climate message? That's my big worry. I'm, I think Extinction Rebellion need to work out whose side, uh, whose side they're on. You know, there are organisations and processes that are actually more likely to be heading in the right, or well, not in the right direction, but are, are more um, sympathetic towards the cause. And, you know, this recent round of attacks on various NGOs that are in the conservation and environment field just seems to me to be kicking the wrong people. It will be a real shame if the public don't get the full benefit of understanding what COP26 is all about in Glasgow. And it just becomes a kind of fist fight between Extinction Rebellion and the rest. Okay. Um, right, we, we are, we're get, getting towards the end. I'm, I'm trying to stick to questions that have been asked by people who haven't asked one previously, if that's okay. So uh, Jack Stewart asks, Good question. Would the encouragement of, of much more hedgerow tree planting make a difference? Um, what incentives could be provided? Well, yeah, it would make a difference, actually, I think. Um, what, what's your view on that, Barbara? Absolutely. Um, the targets, the UK targets include hedgerow as well as trees. And um, they provide, you know, hedgerows um, are just long, thin woodlands, really slightly shorter, long thin woodlands, and they provide a real benefit for both biodiversity 
and permeability of biodiversity through the landscape, as well as for climate change. And particularly if there are standards in them, I mean, there's a lot of really good studies that show that bats in particular migrate along hedgerows with standards in them. So um, I think that uh, encouraging hedgerow planting is a really good idea. There are subsidy schemes all over the place. We need to make sure that we don't go back to the bad old days of ripping up hedges. Um, and yeah, go for it. Okay, um, Robert Ball asks um, the, the question of the moment, I guess, which is um, insufficient action is a real risk. Uh, and we've sort of seen that with Paris. Paris Accords late targets in 2015. What can be done to encourage sufficient action to I, get it agreed at COP26? I think that's where the, you know, I was talking to Christiana Fregueres, who architected the um, Paris Agreement, uh, and it does need a degree of aftercare. One of the problems of COPs is, of course, the presidency stops and um, the um, Quite often the people who've been negotiating the agreements behind the scenes collapse in a heap and go on and do something else. Um, so there needs to be continuity after the conference. There needs to be mechanisms agreed in the agreement for evaluation, for reporting and enforcement. Some mechanisms that uh, at least make it embarrassing for countries, if not it won't make it impossible for countries to not deliver what they're supposed to, but it will at least uh, cast a bright light on that. I mean, the HE target reporting process was ridiculous because it was only really about 18 months ago that we all realised that absolutely sod all had happened. Um, and that's no way to run a big multilateral um, important process like that. So we've got to get these mechanisms right. I think we need the folk who've got the track record to be kept on and not allowed out and to be kept on making sure that implementation does happen from a secretariat point of view, and also um, that the, the ex-presidents need to take a role in taking it forward. Excellent. Um, okay, we have two questions left. Um, the, the, the first one from Robert Thompson, and this is, I don't want to be rude, Barbara, I'm going to give you a break because I can answer this one. But Robert's asking about the significance of the UK being 29th lowest in the biodiversity, whatever it was, is the question. Um, what does that mean? It's the biodiversity intactness index, Robert. The, the lowest is not the best, lowest is worst. So we're 29th from the bottom of, and the bottom is the worst ones. And if you want a briefing on it, go to the Scottish Parliament Information Centre website where you find and put in biodiversity and you'll see a really helpful blog about the biodiversity intactness index tells you all about it. And having answered one of your questions, <laughs> forgive me, Barbara, I'm gonna ask quite a tricky one which is from another anonymous attendee who says, native woodlands grow slowly, especially through regeneration. Will their growth be quick enough to prevent the worst effects of climate change? I think that's why the science is really important and why there's not yet enough good science on naturally regenerating woodland and the carbon cycle. Um, but I think one of the problems of looking at planted woodland, fast growing softwoods and um, slower growing hardwoods is um, that they've been too narrow and they looked at the carbon implications, simply the trees themselves and not of um, some of the subsequent um, uh, downstream impacts, good and bad. So, you know, if you've got a older wood, you've got more mycorrhizal communities and they're all incredibly good at keeping carbon in. And even ancient woodlands that have been around for 400 years, by our estimate, will continue to extract carbon from the atmosphere at a higher and higher increasing rate for the next hundred years. So um, I think the science has got to be kept a very close eye on to make sure that we're not making decisions on the basis of duff science. Um, but also, we've also got to look at what the wood use is, you know, carbon can be sequestered for quite a long time if you put it into a building. Um, and so we've got to look at also what the byproducts are, you know, the brash 
and all of that, what happens to it, what carbon emissions come from that. There's a, it's a big and complicated equation and it's got to be done, done well. Um, so let's not get into silos, not, let's not get into trenches in the spirit of private Fraser, um, where, you know, softwood, quick, good, hardwood, slow, bad. It's, it's much more complicated than that. And irrespective of what CONFOR says, I do not believe that there are research that shows that softwoods, uh, conifers, are as good for biodiversity as native hardwoods is uh, valid. I think it's not very good science, and I'm not convinced. Couldn't possibly comment. Um, yes. Uh, right. Um, that's us at the end, at, at, at end of the questions. And um, thank you, Barbara, for, uh, for, for a fabulous talk. It is so difficult talking to a blank screen when you cannot see the audience. You don't know anybody's there. You could be completely on your own. You could have gone offline. Um, I thought the nose is running. Yeah, if your nose, your nose is running as well. Um, I thought the question session was great. We had an opportunity to actually just interact with you a little bit more. I hope I, I, I did an okay job by, um, by all of our questioners. Thank you so much for those questions. They were great. Um, re really very interesting indeed. And um, all, all that's left for me is, is to say thanks again, Barbara. And um, I, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, Professor Pat Monaghan has switched her camera on and is going to give us some closing words. So all I want to say to the remaining 72 uh, participants, which is, which is pretty amazing, is, is thanks very much for, for listening. And as, as Barbara said, um, may biodiversity always swim across your soup. Uh, OK, thank you uh, very much, Paul. And thank you very much, Barbara. Um, and uh, I'd just like to end the session by saying that the aim of the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow in having these climate change talks was in order to bring information and knowledge, which is core to the society, uh, to bring that knowledge in the context of climate change and biodiversity loss to, to you, the, the public. And we've had three excellent lectures covering different aspects. We had the first one from Pete Smith, a science-based lecture from somebody at the heart of the science of climate change. He told us about its causes, but he also told us about what individuals and communities could do uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change. Then we had Francesca Osowska talking to us about biodiversity loss, uh, about the need for action, about what we might be able to do, and about nature-based solutions and how important those are. And then we've had Barbara speaking to us very much as somebody uh, very involved in policy development from the heart of the UK government, who told us what we need to expect from our politicians for these COP conferences that are coming up um, and uh, stressed again also the important role of civic society in driving change. Uh, civic society, of course, is we, the public, and all of our speakers mentioned the importance of young people. Hugely important, but in terms of fairness, we can't expect young people to do it alone. We, uh, the older generation, part of the cause of this problem, the future is in our hands as much as it is in the hands of younger people and in the, in Thinking about fairness, it's not fair to them to say over to you to take the action. We are where the wisdom should reside and we need to step up to the plate also. So we all need to do what we can. And, and I hope these lectures have provided you with a useful background against which to listen to what happens during the COP26 in Glasgow. So that brings to an end our climate change series over the summer. Uh, the Society will be resuming its normal programme of talks, uh, starting with our first talk on the 6th of October. Uh, as members will know, we cover a huge range of topics. It's not just about philosophy. In fact, it's not particularly about philosophy. It's about knowledge and, and getting that across to people and also giving them the opportunity to engage and question 
experts. So we're putting together our program for the 2021-22 session. And uh, the first talk is on the 6th of October. Uh, initially, our talks will again be online, but we're hoping to be able to move to in-person talks in the not too distant future. So we hope many of you will join the society if you're not already a member and that you'll join us for our first talk on the 6th of October, which is uh, about the Picts and discovering the Picts in Scotland. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Barbara, again. And uh, hope to see as many people uh, again in the future as members of our society. So good night, everybody. And thanks for being here. And thanks for all your engagement with the talks that we've been organizing.